Well, hello again. We're starting off differently today. We usually chat about the film straight away. Mm-hmm. But uh, this time, I thought we'd do a little bit of an introduction because me and Anouk saw this film in a new location. Yes, we did. Yeah. So today's episode is about The Favourite, the period piece featuring Olivia Coleman, Rachel Weiss, Weiss yeah. and Emma Stone. Mm-hmm. Anouk and myself saw this at the Everyman Cinema, which in, in Glasgow, which was a new experience for us because we'd never been. It's located on at Princess Street Gardens, which is a shopping centre part on Buchanan Street. And it's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, it's gorgeous. It, it's one of these um, cinemas that have sofas and cushions and tables and you have a, like two waiters that are pretty much waiting on you the whole film and... So you have food and drink whenever you want. And so it just feels like a spoilt <laughs> evening. It's certainly a decent way to watch the film, I thought. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I think it's a bit more expensive than usual cinema tickets, but... It, actually, it um, wasn't actually that bad. I think it, it was like 12... I think it was like 12 or 14 quid, including the online fee. And for what you got, like seat-wise and average price of a cinema, that wasn't actually that bad. No. So... The reason why we're bringing this up is because we were thinking of do, um, well, we wanted to look into the subscription because it was such an amazing experience. And so we looked up the prices and I think it's, is it £600 so there's, a year? There's three tiers. There's the, the first tier is you get seven free tickets a year, which is, I think it's 60 or 90, I think it might be £90 a year. Okay. And the second tier is you get 21 or 24 tickets a year. Right. It's 300. And then the top one, which is unlimited, is 600 pounds. But it's for two people because... So it's 300 It's pounds. two tickets per show, which... Of course, there's three of us, so that would have been annoying. Because they don't have one, really, for three people. But. They do have the... You can take somebody on a Monday, which would be not bad. But I'm going to... I'm going to email, hopefully, and see if I can... See if there's any... Some sort of arrangement we can come to between being a podcast... And visiting the cinema, so hopefully, yeah. Uh, no, I just wanted to film this little, record this a little bit first because um, I'd say it's well worth going, and I think it's important to talk about they also where do, you see the cinema as well. They also do films that aren't shown in other cinemas, so or are, for example, the favourite you can't see anymore in the Cine World in Glasgow, and we got to see the last viewing. The last few, actually, no, maybe the last still viewing on. ever. It's still are you on. Sure? Yeah, it's still on. I checked. Yeah. So one of the last viewings in the Everyman, and also they have more indie films, which I think is a really. It's always nice to show your respect for indie films. Yeah, they do the um, live streams as well for the theater. Yeah, and they've still got films that are not at screening so far. I.e., Bohemian Rhapsody was on. We could have seen Bohemian Rhapsody. In yeah. the cinema on the full screen. Yeah. And they do special events. I'm looking forward to booking my tickets for the Alien. Oh, of uh, course. Which yeah. is not available at the Cine World in on Renfrew Street. Last no. time I checked. So I'll be going to Everyman to watch it. Right. That, that, there you go. Yeah, that's only in Springburn, right? Yeah. Yeah, which so. is the kind of annoying to get to if you don't have a car. But anyway, so there you go. That's what we thought we'd tell people. And there was nobody on a phone, which Yay. was great as well. So <laughs> we're not after free subscription or whatever or sponsorship we're just trying to see if we can sort out us going for to three see people because it. it might not make sense if it's just for two i don't because i don't mind naming any episode in the future that we see at the everyman is say the film's name at the everyman as you would say as a play is on at a, at a certain theater mm. so. yeah of course yeah it's easier to get to of course fingers crossed let's see what happens uh, so, yeah. this film we're about to talk about was directed by yorgos lantimos you would know him from lobster which for me was weird. I don't think I managed to watch all the way through, but it was quite weird. Mm -hmm. uh, he did after that The Killing of a Sacred Deer, which I really liked. And it was slow paced. There were some very interesting shots, but I was captivated all the way through. Mm -hmm. um, I think with this director, I have kind of a Denis Villeneuve syndrome. Okay. Which means um, Denis Villeneuve did Prisoners, I didn't like. He did Enemy, I didn't like. He did Sicario, I loved. Arrival, I loved. Blade Runner 2049, I loved. The Favourite, so <laughs> it didn't resonate with me at all. So in order not to be bored for an hour talking about this movie and actually learn a, a few things, I have questions for you guys. 
<laughs> All right, oh, cool. Good. We're yeah. not going to repeat I Tonya then. No. Excellent. <laughs> so the UK's regime is a constitutional monarchy. Uh, we have a representative democracy, the French Republic. So I was not brought up in all that uh, kind of royalty kind of atmosphere. This film is about one of your queens, yeah. Queen Anne. Do you learn about royalty at school? Is that heavy in your curriculum? Or? Well, this will be an interesting question because me and Anouk went to two different schools in two different countries. So let's find out. That's very true. Anouk? I think there's a lot of focus on certain areas of royalty. Of course, the royalty used to govern. We didn't. They, there wasn't a prime minister. Oh, no. No, no, no there, there is wasn't. a prime minister, yes. There was. Yeah. Like, there was always a prime minister. That's who the... Like Lord Chamberlain kind yeah. of thing? Mm. Mm, right. They are opposite parties. Nicholas Hurst, is it? The, Nicholas uh, Holt. Holt, sorry, is the Tory. leader of the Tory party, or the landowner's party, essentially. Sorry, I misunderstood. So... The but you uh, they'd romanticize it by saying okay so now we do the Tudors now we do the Stuarts Stuarts yeah but you don't go through each one and only certain people and I think it's because it's probably easier to tell you certain stories if they're a bit more fun like Henry the Eighth and his wives that was so focused on I don't know do you know yeah 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 and so you, so you do the Tudors and the Stuarts uh, um, in history at school. We do Tudors, we do... Oh, gosh. I mean, we must do others. Was it constitutional already, or what was was the, did it start with, a, as we had, like, Louis XVI, like, absolute monarchy? Yeah, oh, of course. Yeah. It was, it, well, yeah. It, it changed. In Scotland, well, at my school, at least, part of the curriculum is you learn about Scottish history as more of us. So I never did the Tudors and the Stuarts. We did... Uh, obviously, the the war, the independence wars of the 1300s. Mm. At higher, we did the birth of modern politics, which of 18, 1850 onwards. So the introduction of secret balloting and the formation of like uh, women's vote and so on and forth, stuff like that. Uh, but I never did kings and queens of England uh, at all, to my knowledge. I don't think we did. But monarchy. That's interesting. But that's that's up here. So yeah, you know, of course, it was a monarchy for ages. Because the argument nowadays is like the, because it's a constitutional monarchy, the monarchy don't do anything. They're heads of state, but I mean, they, in the, terms of law changing, they don't do anything. But they go to events nearly every day. The queen, the queen starts parliament after every election. You have to go to the queen and ask for a general election, and you have to go and ask her to form a government. Mm. So when a party wins, there's always the footage of them following the car, the tax, not the taxi, the 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 whatever car it is. The, it's usually like one of these Mercedes or Mercs or whatever. Bentley. Yeah, well, not a Bentley. If it's a politician, probably they're not. Oh really? You know, you got to look a little um, human. Like Bentleys for like heads of state for sure, but for politicians. So, sorry, that's like, what I thought you meant. Anyway, it might be Bentleys. I might just have been total arse myself, but I don't think it is. They have to go and ask to form a government in her in her name. So yeah. it's the British got it's the party of the the government of Queen Elizabeth, yada yada. Right. Fourth. Um, but I, I'll just check the now when monarchy the constitutional monarchy started. I went to visit. I mean, the way she, the way Elizabeth the second is perceived. I mean, perceived. I don't know, but I've I've been to visit. I visited the, the Tower of London, and you've got this uh, ER everywhere. <laughs> Which always led me to wonder. Well, they'll have to get some uh, some money to replace all of those when the day comes. Oh yeah, mm. and and uh, money and every like everything has to change. It's 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 quite it's quite. And also uh, recently, I think maybe because of social media has given everyone a voice, and we know certain things now. You know, you have everyone wanting to say something. The royal family have got a lot of backlash hmm. recently because they live in these amazing castles houses around the country um they have amazing carriages and live these amazing lives and there are people outside homeless so it's i mean I, throughout history you've always had people hating on the royal family because it's like a um it's a facade right it's like your country has this amount of money but is it really given to everyone no so uh yeah and is is that is that money coming? Because I, um, where is their their money coming from? Is like tax or what? What's, tax. Yeah, mostly. Yeah, 
I just read something fascinating. Uh-huh. Go on. Um, so I was looking up constitutional market uh, monarchy. This is from Wikipedia, so it could, you know, it's Wikipedia. It could go either way. Queen Anne in Britain is the last one to use the uh, the, veto, the veto, the monarch's ability to veto votes in Parliament, right? Ah. And the last one she did was on the 11th of March, 1708, as she blocked the Scottish Militia Bill. Oh. Which was basically to allow Scotland to arm the militia. Ah. So, I, so the idea of having a Scottish army, in a way, that wouldn't be... Because Scotland was unified by this point. Of course. Uh, as part of the, the kingdom again. That's interesting. So so Queen Anne is Olivia Colman's character yes. in The Favourite, just to keep everyone on board. <laughs> Here's what the Wikipedia says about constitutional monarchy. The, an absolute. In the Kingdom of England, the glorious revolution of 1688 led to the constitutional mo- monarchy restricted by laws such as Bill of Rights. Okay. Basically, unhappiness of the monarchy would have to... There are... Uh, the Act Settlement of 1701, although limits on the power of a monarch, a limited monarchy, there are much older, so like Magna Carta and stuff. So essentially, as time gets on and the people start having more of a voice, as less of a serfdom, government pass bills to limit the ability of the monarchy, i.e. they can't just go, no, 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 no we're not doing that, and have their own laws. And then it has to be voted upon. Like now we have Parliament for that. Right, right. So it's interesting. So you you already, you already had the Constitution as far back as the 1600s when we had our revolution in 1700. 17... Oh, constitutional would be if it was the end of if it was 1700, it'd be the 18th century. Yeah, yeah, I know. But didn't you say 16 something? 1689 is when the the law the Bill of Rights. So that's the end of the 17th century. Yes. Right. So yeah, we had our revolution a hundred years after that. 1789. And, and we still had uh, Napoleon after that. Anyway, so. <laughs> yeah, it's complicated. I th- I think that's the thing. Like, um, the British like to talk about how you know we have records since thirteen hundred. Well, n- well, not no, ten sixty six. Even you know we have the Magna Carta. So um, we've kind of been sort of kept going since ten sixty six, right? So we have this whole thing of like. We've never had a revolution and we've always been all right. I mean, of course not, but yeah. The unification, the Union with Scotland Act of 1706 is when Scotland becomes part of the Union. Right. For anyone interested. Which is at the the time of the two that we will talk uh, in the next episode, Mary, Queen of Scots, right? True, yes. Yes, yes. That's more history for everyone. It's interesting. We have two period films for the oscars oh the americans love a period film that's why they go nuts for Downton abbey and stuff like that that's very true yeah <laughs> they they like the the royal family don't they so mm-hmm. do you feel well probably adam a bit less because you were not brought up in that as you said <laughs> would you would it affect you in any way at all if the queen were to disappear today today depends how much of a royalist you are i mean i don't think i would be that bothered I, that, it doesn't affect me but personally because i know her so well <laughs> no i don't i don't know i don't really know i mean i don't i have no opinion about it to be honest i mean i don't I, some people care about the oh they take so much money some people go be up they bring tourists and i'm like it's it's something you can't really just ex- well people did exile kings and monarchs i mean you look through history all that sort of crazy stuff i don't know i don't think it's worth worrying about i think there are bigger issues in the world to worry about than should the monarchy exist because it doesn't i mean it does it constitutional monarchy yeah it exists but the queen could never come in and veto something anymore like the world is so we've been so far removed from the absolute monarchy for nearly, i think the queen like, can veto some stuff well no well that's what that bill was the the queen anne was the only one the last one able to do that the veto i mean she can maybe but not it's... veto but i think she can she does have some sway in certain aspects i don't know what, what but i don't think she's totally powerless let me find out would i be upset i would be upset because we are a monarchy in some places and it's part of your history and some of the things of the royal family like for example you know tower of london buckingham palace like Beef they're fingers. amazing beautiful things right that we would lose if all that money went to, you know, like back into the economy and helping people out, oof, I mean, yeah, I, I could, I couldn't say no. I don't. I think that's it would be unfair to because the 
it's not we're not in a great place but i think it would be sad and the other royals were you following the lady dionas the thing and the royal wedding no i mean it's a spectacle royal wedding my mum loves a royal wedding can you just you know get to look at some dresses and stuff but i actually went <laughs> well not to the wedding but i was in the is it hyde park no. Oh. Is that the one? The park in London? Yeah. Well, with the giant, uh, they, so the eldest, who is, I don't remember, well, the one who married Kate Middleton, <laughs> uh, married on the same day, um, Hitler and Eva Brown killed themselves in the bunker. 29th oh. of April. Oh, Love, God. Lovely. Um, Horrible. There are powers that could, I've looked up for, I'll, I'll leave a link to the royalcenter.co.uk and you can find a list of things that the Queen can and can't do. Oh, uh, interesting. The one we're talking about is the royal assent. It is the Queen's right and responsibility to grant at assent to bills from Parliament, signing them into law. Whilst in theory she could decide to refuse assent, the last monarch to do this was Queen Anne in 1708. I say I'm not making that a law. Cool. So in that list, will it always also talk about the, I think, the, the kind of when you purchase a house, it's only for 99 years or something? There's something like this? I've heard that one, but... Uh, the idea that the Queen can take back your property. I mean, I guess, but like that's ever going to harm. I don't know. I, I, I've, I've never seen that happen. I've heard people say this, but I don't know where it comes from. Okay. Well, in this specific movie, there is something strange, uh, not in the neighborhood, but happening in dun, 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 dun. In, for an actor's or an actress's uh, self-esteem. So you've got Olivia Colman, who's been nominated for lead actress, and you've got Rachel Weisz and Emma Stone, both nominated for uh, supporting actress. Mm. And Rachel Weisz won the BAFTA. She did. Yes. And Emma Stone didn't. Uh, so I reckon Emma Stone might win the... Olivia Coleman won too, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we just means yeah. in the supporting category. Yeah, the supporting Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. I reckon Emma Stone might win the Oscar, because America, maybe America will give it to Emma Stone. If there's any fairness in the world, that's how you would do that, if for that quality, for the, the way that is thing. I mean, film, again, I heard Kamo talk about it, because quite useful, because obviously he's a, I think he's a, a member of BAFTA. He does get a vote for, that would make sense. for BAFTA. Yeah. He explains it as the reason that you don't, and he explained it with the Maharshala, Maharshala Ali and uh, uh, Viggo Mortensen case, is that you usually don't want people in the same film competing against each other in the same category. However, uh -huh. in this one, they have no choice because you can only have one lead actress. So I reckon that it's a choice between, the one, they decide who the lead is, which is a difficult one in that story because I there we can talk for days about who is the protagonist. I I might ask that question after this point, who you think the protagonist is. So they've opted to put uh, Emma Stone and Rachel Weisz against each other rather than against Olivia Coleman and other people. And also it might be to do who, for who else is in the lead actress category. They went, well, maybe they stand a better chance in this category. We'll never know because we're not behind the production that pedal yeah, but I mean, the film forward. Yeah, when the For Your Consideration campaigns, that's, yes, when, yeah. that's when they push the people. Mm -hmm. So I don't... Yeah. So a question, who's the protagonist? Whose story are we? Whose story is this? Whose journey? Who what's the journey? Who 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 goes on one? I mean they all do, but I think it's uh well, my initial reaction was Emma Stone. I would say Abigail, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I would tend to think that. <laughs> because you kind of follow her coming into the castle and then her, the way that she manipulates her, her way up and then the fact that she then sees that well the queen sees that she's a bit of a bitch and then treats her like a servant and that's the end mm. right like she kind of that's sort of the arc that we go through in the film but i mean they're saying that it's olivia coleman right well the lead actress i would say olivia coleman is the top billing of the film you know if you look right, at a poster yeah. the name that would appear first in the credits is definitely olivia coleman sure because of um, the character she's playing you wouldn't second bill the queen if the story is about the queen. the queen you know even if it is about the servants because that's quite an easy way to get into a story is putting you putting your audience in the shoes of somebody sort of relatable nobody can re relate to royalty but we can relate to somebody that starts off in a job with no power and wanting to rise that that story rags to riches idea transcends history if we look even as far back to ancient, well, yeah, ancient scripts of like the original stories where Aladdin comes from, you know, like these stories of rags to riches that exist. Thousand, yeah, the Arabian uh, Nights, uh, the uh, tales of the Arabian Nights, yeah, 
all these stories are epic poems like um, Gilgamesh. Well, from, oh, also uh, the title for this is The Favourite, Not Queen Anne. Yes, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which would would be connected to Emma Stone. Well, I mean, the them, relationship really, yeah. between the supporting actresses, that's, that's interesting. It's funny because um, the place where we look at history for ladies of the court and learning all these tactics that is famous, the ma- mainstream people will know from the way Game of Thrones is and all the political espionage and all these sort of like hiding out in the shadows does come from France in the courts, you know, the ladies in waiting. Mm. Uh, Interesting. I, that's what uh, it's the French monarchy is quite famous for. So you would send you would send people to France to learn the way of court. Yeah, there is uh. a f- French film called Ridicule, which is it's all about the wit and the humor in court and all mm. the courtiers and a very very nice yeah uh, thingy. There there is a motif here that uh, when I noticed it, I got quite annoyed because it drills your ears. Hmm. So it's the uh, violin note followed by the ding, pi- piano. Like, nye, do, nye, yeah. do. You didn't like that? Well, uh, it, it drilled my ears a few times. I really liked that. <laughs> I thought that made certain scenes because it was, it was annoying and it was creepy. And I think that it kind of added to... You know how the cinematography, quite a lot of it was gaudy and wrought gold and, you know, like Buckingham Palace, pretty much setting and huge gardens, etc. Like very extravagant. And then you have this really weird violin thing. It sounded like a violin. It was like, but like a a violin that's played sort of wrong. (laughs) What was very interesting, I finally get to use my higher and advanced higher music listening course. Yes. So the film is set that the early start of the 1700s, which for all you listeners that studied music would be, and I'll wait for you to say it. Baroque. The Baroque era, correct. The Baroque era ends... Did you really? Yeah. So what? What? Rococo. I'll, I'll give you. A mo- I'll give you a mo- multiple choice then. What followed? Rococo. Rococo. What followed the Baroque era? Renaissance. <laughs> what followed Baroque? The Renaissance period or the classical era? Renaissance. Correct. Well done. And when did that end? So when did the Renaissance music start? Start. Yeah. What year? What year? Yeah. Oh, what gosh. year? Uh, seventeen fifty-four. I'll give you a guess. You're close. You're with. You're with. You're five in or out. I'll give you one more guess. I'll give you a clue. It's a round number. Seventeen sixty. Oh, nearly. Seventeen fifty. Correct. I was. Bar- a, I was amazed if you got that in one go. So that's <laughs> that's when the Baroque era. Anyway, that's- the point I'm making making is the piano, which you're referring to there, is invented in the early 1700s. So only rich people would own a piano. So it's quite clever. Mm. Piano I I was listening when I was in the, when I was listening to it I was like I'm in love with this because the at the beginning of the film it's mainly harpsichord. Mm. The difference between a piano and a harpsichord is a harpsichord the in a piano you've got the a beater it's not, and it hits the string. So in a way people argue it's like the piano is not a key instrument it's a percussion because there's a, a hammer hitting the when you press the key a hammer hits the uh. string. Harpsichord it's plucked which gives you like ding, 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 ding. like you can hear it like the recital when Rachel Vice's character appears again that is a harpsichord not a piano. Yeah, because you can tell by the the way the music sounds. So when the piano comes in later on, I'm like, that's clever because only this family would have because the royalty would be able to have the luxury of this brand new thing called the piano, and also it wouldn't be popular yet because nobody has learnt how to use it properly and invent music with it yet. So the idea of baroque music there was really interesting, and the way that baroque music is, uh, well, you get, we get sort of like concerto pieces later on as we go further in period. So the idea of smaller recitals, there wouldn't be like these massive halls of like, and long pieces. It'd be quite short pieces, which I quite liked. I'm glad to report that I knew it was harpsichord. Yeah. Uh, thanks to the subtitles who said the harpsichord playing. <laughs> is it really? <laughs> Sometimes those, the, the, it's actually uh, an added bonus to have subtitles. It tells you certain things. Yeah. The, so the, it's interesting because I don't think I've ever seen. So basically when you're using these days a GoPro, the, om- the image you're left with is fish-eyed. So it's really weird like round spherical and yeah. that's like they had some of the shots that were uh, that way fish eyed which was interesting i don't think of like like even bigger than a master shot like was huge like 170 degrees 
Was that to show the like the expanse of the the castle? Uh, at one point, you could see the whole corridor. Mm. Ah, yes, yes. Which, with the standard lens, obviously, you can't. Um, there was an interesting also some reminiscent, well, not necessarily, but in Roma, you had some panning, slow pannings. In this one, you had uh, the camera moving from a uh, wide angle mm. very fast to the opposite one. Right. And a slow pan to this. I saw that mm. a few times. That, that's uh, that's quite interesting way to, to do things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, there was a lot of panning camera shots. And that corridor kind of became famous in the, in the film. It was used so many times, like people walking towards you or away from you. And yeah, it was, it, that was interesting. Did anyone done. get a sort of Wes Anderson feel? Do you know what I mean? The, like Grand Budapest Hotel, sort of like you would have like the stylish shots with these, with these expanded shots as Jan's talking about. I got this quite a nice feel of that. I was like, that's quite nice. That's interesting. Mm. I was about to say Wes Craven. That would have been even. That would have been a much. That would have been a you great. A, 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 West, you, a Wes Craven horror film set in this time period would be fucking amazing. When you said uh, Wes Anderson, I thought of Woody Allen. So that's <laughs> okay. just three people just coming into. And it's, and it's like there wasn't a guy called my mother. My mother. I was just like, well, I was just thinking. The moose. Woody Allen, why? Why are you bringing why in Woody, bring Woody Allen? <laughs> um, one thing that I also, also struggled with is you are being sold something hilarious by the trailer. And I didn't feel it was that every review says that that's the funniest comedy of the year or something, or some stuff like that. I didn't get that uh, fun at all. <laughs> no, I, I, I was laughing, but not in a like, this is a comedy because it wasn't i thought this was and i don't even think that this was a black comedy either because it i don't think it had enough comedic moments in it to be a black comedy what did we say recently wasn't a black comedy that wasn't funny yeah um oh we recorded it. we did we, we just recorded it and said if it was a it tried to be a black comedy it failed because it wasn't funny at all it wasn't funny at all it was either no it wasn't uh it wasn't black really comedy because you said it's a drama right rather than uh, a green book no, because I said that did it right. Because that was a comedy. Uh, okay, it will come back to us. Um, uh, yeah, so I colossal. I, yeah, that's colossal. It. That's well it. Done. Yeah, it right. wasn't funny enough. I think, but I I say that with love because I did love this film, hmm. but it wasn't a comedy. And I this is another classic example of films lying to you in the trailer. <laughs> because it does come across as literally every single thing in it is hilarious and that is just not what this film is it's not a comedy it's pretty dark actually and it gives you a trailer that a trailer has to be fast paced and this is uh slow paced so i i actually yeah. i thought the opposite you thought this was fast i usually hate i hate period films i don't know why i hate period films but i, I just find them Sometimes so slow and the whole, you know, like sitting around drinking tea, discussing things idea, you know, that, that it's like, like the idea, I think it would take me about a billion years to read a Bronte because it would be like, oh, just get going. It doesn't matter if you're walking through a field discussing your feelings or hiding, you know, like, you know, the sort of Wuthering Heights way of like, Aww. you know, and he, is Heathcliff Wuthering Heights or is it the other one? Yes. Just like, oh, he's a... He's coming up on a horse Have over there. Have you read Wuthering Heights, Adam? Of course I've not read Wuthering Adam, Heights. Adam, you can't hate on something if you haven't no, no, read no, no. it. Look, That's not fair. No, no, no. What I mean is the idea... I don't hate the play. I hate that the, 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 that specific piece. What I mean is that that genre. You know, like I just find it really slow-paced. And I was, I, I was surprised at how much I enjoyed this because I actually felt this had a, re a relatively quick pace to it. I didn't think anything lingered. There was never anything that was left to settle. It was always... It was like a very speedy game of chess. It was like, because in chess, if you know the move you're going to make, you can make it quickly. And it was like, once they figured out the move they were going to do to advance themselves as being the favourite, it was like, bam, I'm doing it. There was no waiting around to implement it. It was like, happens now, happens now, happens now, back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. Uh, which I thought was quite fast-paced. But I'm interested to hear that you thought it was quite slow. Uh, oh, no, sorry, go no, on. Uh, yeah, maybe not not the edit, but I had a feeling that some scenes were lingering. Actually, yeah, I I, I think uh, um, uh, Adam that there have been films before that were that were boring, right? And Fair maybe enough. you're yeah. seeing that, and actually this was slow paced, but because it was so 
enchanting to watch it felt like it was fast like it, it didn't feel like it was two hours long do you know what i mean mm. because That's you're not enough. you're not like dying every minute because you want it to be over because <laughs> the story was so interesting mm. and pretty historically accurate if you can believe it i got if i believed it I, I went with it i didn't think for a minute that queen anne having a you know an affair with a woman was that outrageous i'm like i bet if that even if that isn't true i'm like i believe it i know it's not a new thing is it well they they, they it's it's certain historians say one way or the other like no one really knows but that's his history but um uh i was about to call her stephanie why um because we just talked about lady gaga today oh right yeah uh oh God, what's her name who uh rachel weiss's character Oh, uh, Marlborough. Lady Marlborough. Lady, Lady Marlborough actually blackmailed Queen Anne with their personal letters, but mm. that would hint that it was sexual in nature, but it also could be anything because yeah. we actually never got to see those letters. So that's probably where the director got the, the idea from that like, okay. oh yeah, let's make this sexual and make it maybe a love story. Well, ish. That's up to you to decide because we went to see it with our friend Rachel and she thought we th we we all discussed it and at first immediately we were like yes of course she, Lady Marlborough was in love with Queen Anne and then after we had a long discussion about it we were like ah uh, was she <laughs> I don't think she was I don't maybe she wasn't because <laughs> um, Abigail definitely wasn't no in love with um, anyone I think I think that um, Marlborough's character. That because they've they've kind of had this relationship for for a long time, she's able to use that fact that Queen Anne probably does have feelings for her, but she's she's got a husband, she cares about him as well as in her heart caring about Queen Anne, but ultimately not in the same way that she might care about her. So I think it's a bit of like one person really into the relationship, the other person knowing that, and if need be, I can use that to my advantage. Yeah, yeah, of course. Mm. I th I think as well, like she, it's difficult because there were moments where they had like a nice scene together, but it all seemed a little bit manipulative mm. and it was all a bit on the surface. Like nothing was really, I don't know, like she didn't seem that sad either when she was kicked out of the castle. Um, so I don't know. I didn't, I didn't feel like Queen Anne was loved at all. Which I think also added to the fact that this character is really sad and lonely. And that's probably why she's so mad. <laughs> Just randomly screaming at people to stop music was pretty much three scenes. <laughs> she had this she had this real weird thing about music, right? Like every single time there was music or, or people dancing, she'd be like, stop it, stop it, stop it. I thought that was because that somebody, it was, she was seeing Marlborough enjoy herself without her. That's what I read those as. Yeah, the dancing. The dancing sure. is, is that... Yeah, yeah, that's maybe not, interesting. Maybe not, but then it could be the music as well, because obviously she's riddled with gout. Well, this is what I thought. I thought it's because she was sad that she couldn't dance, and so she was jealous of anyone being able to dance, because she seemed a bit like that, like slightly narcissistic and a little bit mad. And so if she saw anyone dancing... yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's interesting. That's one word your anglophones borrowed from us. Gout. Gout. Gout, which is a drop. Ah, yeah. why is it called that? I, I don't know. I've, uh, mm. yeah, it's it's actually weird. Maybe it's the lymph that does weird, that is flowing weirdly in the... Isn't it known as the royal disease? Because it's usually rich, the royalty that get it, because it's to do with, like, excess rich food or something. Yeah, well, this is why there was that scene where she's just eating all that bad stuff, and that, and kind of, it's like a, you know when you eat because you're filling a void? Yes. kind of what she was doing <laughs> like filling something and then and also when she immediately threw up <laughs> in a very expensive looking <laughs> vase when yeah. when that scene happened you won't have this in france i might or you will you'll have a version of some kind it's there's a show in britain called the antiques roadshow which is a, a sunday evening program that is hosted by somebody and it's basically a lot of uh, antiques dealers will you can bring your you can bring your antique to whatever the event is it goes around the country and they they talk about it and the tv program is structured that it's it goes from piece to piece to piece but hundreds of people come to show items and they mainly talk about things that have a story behind them 
So it's like, oh, wait, wait, I got inherited this from my grandfather. It's a painting. He loved it. He bought it for like four pounds and a, and a goat back in the day. And we found it in, in, in the attic and it's been in the family for like 400 years. And then it goes on and on and on. And everyone at home's going, oh, just tell us how much it's worth. Uh, for two reasons. One reason is if they go, your, um, your item is worth today about two million pounds at auction. That would be my guess. Everyone goes, oh, how lucky for them. But, and this might just be my family and uh, or my father. We, I don't know. It's probably, a, I, I bet it does happen. You're sitting at home going, oh, be worth bugger all. You either want it to be worth loads of money or worth hee-haw because... Because there's a game you play, because if it's worth nothing, they always say, well, I would never part with it anyway. Um, right? They always do that. And, but anyway. Sentimental. You know, but the reason I'm telling the story is because that, when she's being sick into one of these vases, I could just see that on the show. It's like, and what have you brought us today? Well, I've actually brought you this, uh, this vase because it's, we, we've recently found out from the, the film The Favourite that, uh, royalty used to vomit in these jars. So we, so we sent it off to an analyst to see if we could find anything in the, and it turns out, uh, a royal has vomited in this jar at one point. There's something and they go, oh, there's some, there's some, there's some royal vomit in here. That's worth at least twelve million pounds <laughs> at auction today. Queen Anne. There's, um, there's a hot market for royal vomit. DNA um, is uh, just. What, um, is that the same show? I've seen something recently. So is that something that there is a panel of three people and that person is coming and telling the story and they try to sell? Or is that something different? I think that's something different. But it's the it's, it, There are various antique. There are people. Yeah. There are sorry. various antique shows on British TV, so it could equally be another antique show but not the one i'm talking of the one i'm talking about it's called the antiques road show um it's a it's a sunday evening light entertainment show basically uh it's all right it's a good the, i used to hate it though because it was on a sunday evening at eight o'clock uh at night and it would be i'd realize oh i've got to go to school soon Aww. because it, did you ever yeah. have that when you were a kid you like saw something that was traditionally on later in the evening you're like oh bollocks i've got school in the morning yeah of course. Anyway, but yeah, good scene with her vomiting and the thing. I, I did. I also did think of like Christ, how much did that vase work? Because it looks like pure silver. Yeah, it was. It was beautiful. While we were in the cultural things, I and uh, you talked about watching TV at school and missing because you're at school. Uh, I've never. So I notice here you have some like kind of quiz shows where they talk about the news or even the question time thingy. I don't think, well, first of all, uh, my, my uncle Remy, the one with the nightis who was in the, the episode, the questionnaire. Oh, yeah. He, from the start, he knew he, he didn't want a TV in his house. So his right. kids were raised without one. Okay. Uh, I was raised with one, but I stopped early to watch the skit, the programming mm -hmm. and focusing more on movies. So you don't see me ever in a room here watching TV. No, you're always watching a film or Netflix or, you know, doing your own thing. That's true. I mean, we don't have digital set up in our TV because we never phoned to do that, which because you'd have to get like a cable or a box or whatever. So we just use it. And I don't think that's really the case anymore because you've got like iPlayer and all the channels do have their own version of streaming. So digital telly is kind of like slowly fading out, I would say, for sure, because it's... It's just so easy to go on Netflix and choose anything you want or yeah. Amazon Prime. You've literally got everything. Mm -hmm. And that's why, well, we recently found out that FOP is okay in Glasgow, right? They but saved it. They saved yeah. it. But it was going down because no one buys things anymore. It's I mean, with the with people going into vinyl again, I think that's probably why people are going back to these stores I for mean, like nostalgic sake. But I mean, yeah. how many times has HMV been in? bankrupt <laughs> i know i know so many times you know it's very sad um, um, there used to be it, one on princess street in edinburgh that i used to go to a lot but it's 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 finally gone so and now uh, there's a, a mogul wanting to buy them but he wants like a six month free rent or something oh uh, currently wow yeah anyway good luck they saved the buyer's road one which is good stuff because yeah. it's a nice shop yeah, i like cool. it how um, did we get here oh my, well i'm not yeah, that well i that. well i've decided i wanted to be an actor and I moved to Glasgow. Oh, to stop it. To become an actor. Very we, good, Adam. And we met three years ago. So we did. Humans, dinosaurs first. <laughs> and then... Well, when a man loves a lady, <laughs> they say, uh, do you want to come and watch The Favourites um, in a dark room? Well, so there are, I think, two nice homages, or it's just, homages, or it's just me seeing things. <laughs> the Breaking Bad hand job sequence. Oh, yes. 
Yes. And Emma, well, a big girl kicking herself in the face, just like in a, the during Fight Club. Oh, with a book, yeah. Yes. On purpose to, like... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that takes some focus, man. Mm. Oh, I don't think I could ever do that. Hit myself in the face. Jesus. Um, quite a brutal scene. I quite liked how they did it. Because you didn't see the book, and so you didn't see it coming, and you're like, oh! <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. But you feel, do you have anything... Uh, we are at 45 uh, minutes already. Oh, fuck, we haven't even talked about the film. Yeah. Jesus. I, there was another case of protagonist syndrome, again, when uh, Emma Stone is clearly in the library to try and find a book to just, you know, get more smart. And she happens to see the, the, the Queen and Marlborough getting off with each other. And she's like, oh, oh, I can use this. So, uh, right place, right time, pro protagonist syndrome again. There is uh, already something called a main character syndrome, which is entirely different to what you're calling protagonist what's syndrome. Main, what's main um, character syndrome? Main, I don't remember, because when I was, uh, I don't, uh, maybe... Uh, is it like plot armor? I, a, a main character is safe from any danger because they're the main character? No, uh, no, but I'll, I'll find that out at some point. All right. But so what immediately comes into my head would maybe be either, yeah, you're in the right place at the right time or in terms of you're in the right place at the right time because you are avoiding a little bit like is if anyone's watching you on Netflix... He, the main guy is pretty much about a stalker stalking this one girl and they obviously they end up going out, but he's still like stalking her and like finding out certain things, etc. But basically she always narrowly misses seeing him. So it could be that as well. Mm. Like a main character just narrowly misses the dramatic part because it needs to keep being suspenseful. You I've know? always found the one annoying, which is the whenever it's a case of somebody's day, daily life, that everything seems to happen to them on the same day. When is anything, if any of your lives, if anything, is anything dramatic? So when something dramatic happens to you on one day, has anything else dramatic happened on the same day ever? It's very rare. It is rare, isn't it? But yeah. in films, it's like, oh, you, oh, your dog died? Well, uh, we're here to kick you out of your apartment. Oh, are we kicking you out of your apartment? I'm sorry, you've uh, you've got uh, you've got frostbite. Oh, uh, well, that, that, that ev when everything, all the universe is turning towards this thing happening, that's a plot contrivance. Yeah, yeah. Right. I think, yeah. But yeah, main character syndrome, it's actually a deeper, well, a bit deeper. A type of condition characterized by one feeling as though they are destined to become a main character through processing attributes and or having events happen in their life that cause them to become like the protagonist of any fictional story. So it's a real thing. As in, as this is a psychological disorder, sorry. No, 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 no. That's to the, no, 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 no. It's in, in, kind of a film thing well that's that's on the urban dictionary but uh, uh the first time i saw it was on the on uh some other place wikipedia right, i think okay. tv trope tv trope that's yeah. interesting i haven't heard that one yeah i th i think as well that scene that you were just talking about is interesting because it shows how she also progresses in her manipulation because she bumps into nicholas holt's character hawley Harley? It's like Harley. I think it's Harley. Harley. I don't remember. I always see him a uh, big blue beast in uh, X-Men. So. Oh, right, yeah. Well, Nicholas we, Holt. We see him as Tony from Skins. Tony from Skins. He, they, they bump into each other and he asks, like, you know, you're getting closer to the Queen. Like, do you want to, you know, like, give me some information and I'll give you some information, etc. We can help each other. And she says no. And then, of course, later on, you see her specifically going up to him and saying, look, we can help each other mm. because she's like desperate. Also, she's, it's like a Lady Marlborough's mate uh, pissed off Abigail at this point, right? Because she basically doesn't want her to get closer to the queen. Yeah. So she's probably at that point saying, oh, I'll do anything. So I'm going to go back to Harley and say, yeah, I can tell you anything you want to know about the queen. Mm. If you help me, so... I'm interested to find out, uh, because the film kind of makes you root for Emma Stone's character the whole way through, until a certain point. And in, ah. in my opinion, that moment happens when we get the montage of her like at that sort of party, and obviously Rachel Weisz's character has disappeared, so... And at that moment, you kind of are like, I don't like you anymore. Like, when she gets to the position she wants to be in, she becomes this unlikable character. 
You're definitely supposed to not like her at that point. Yeah. I think I was starting to get worried, though, was when she poisons Lady Marlborough. Because, Mm. honestly, it was a little bit fun before then. And then, so I actually honestly thought that that might be, like, a laxative. (laughs) You know, to just kind of, like, add to the, like... I just want you out of this room so that I can be alone with the queen. I thought that too. But I also too, don't want to yeah. kill you. But she actually poisons her. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. Thought, I thought she killed her. Oh, really? Did you? Th- <laughs> no, I, I thought laxative as well, actually, when she did it. But it yeah. wouldn't shoot her fall off the horse. Oh, fuck. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And obviously she didn't know that she would fall off the horse and then get trapped on the, on the, on the sad the thing and then get dragged the for rapes. however long. Yeah. So it didn't end up well, but... She did poison her in terms of she was throwing up and she was pretty ill for for a few days. I also got really worried when when Lady Marlborough found herself in a in a in a brothel because I was like, oh god, is this where this film is going? That she's just going to become a prostitute now? <laughs> you can suck for your supper. Yeah, the exactly. quote, I'm like, oh fucking hell, Jesus Christ! Oh, that reminds me, uh, Anouk. Question for you. What do you mean? This reminds me, Anouk. <laughs> <laughs> while you're there wow sorry oh jesus well this is well we know what section's going out for the podcast awards next year that this section here oh that's embarrassing okay. anyway, that was a on. good joke Nick. well done thank you very good adam is always surprised when i'm funny i no feel way. like this is so unfair i'm a funny person go on adam go on so there's the use of the sea bomb a fair um, amount in this film. A lot, yeah. So I'm curious, because we had this conversation with Paul, where if a man says it to a woman, you're like, whoa, 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 that's out of order. Yeah. But I didn't find it offensive if a woman called and used it to talk about another woman. No. So I'm curious what you think, Anouk. Being a woman. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Would you ever call another woman a cunt? Of course. If it was, if it was needed... Yeah. But th- I mean, that is a rare moment. If someone is a cunt, it's like there's no going back because I don't think you call someone that and then you're friends the next week. You yeah. know, this is it's like a end all relationship type of word for me because I think it's really intensely horrible. And they don't even use it in like an insulty way, like "oh, you're a you're a c word." They use like "oh yeah, she loves." Sorry, am I not supposed to say the word? I think no. I realized. I I realized we said it. It just means we have to put an e sticker on the podcast. Okay, whatever. Because I just because I because I heard you say c bomb and I was like, oh god, I've been. No, No, but they use just that it's the end of the segment for the podcast awards. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's that's that's the version of the clap. (laughs) No, the 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 idea that they use it not just to be like an insult, like oh you're 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 a cunt. It's more like oh yeah, she loves having her whatever you know like they use yeah. it in that sense yeah, so which, it's, it's which, a word for a vagina yeah they yeah. use it there and i'm like oh i've never heard it used like that even nowadays yeah i think it's because it's very um visceral and mm. violent yeah so if someone says it's, it's usually like laddish culture like oh yeah like her cunt was etc et <laughs> no, do you know what i mean God. though it's like it's sorry i'm uh, sorry be. yeah exactly it's like this kind of violent way of of saying it but i also it's interesting because it, there is a feeling that you get with certain words but i i also i i don't agree with this is allowed but this is not allowed you know if you want equality there are certain things that you have to kind of mm. you can't have both worlds you can't be expecting certain things when you want something else i just thought that because i never heard it and being used as in that way i know which but is quite a if you call me a, uh, but if you call me a cunt and emma calls me a cunt i will be offended because it shouldn't change depending on what gender you are no i didn't mean by that i was just like I, no 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 but 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 that that's a good point because i think there are lots of people that would and i'm not hating on them either hmm. it's just for me personally I tr- I try not to do that because that's a visceral feeling and that shouldn't be then mm. like worded out and say you know oh. because it's not Emma Stone would not call you that why <laughs> you don't know her that well <laughs> well you know you never know no do you uh, not know Nick was up for this part <laughs> that's why that's why Nick's uh, I've called her many words under the sun <laughs> stealing my part stealing my part oh dear um. 
Anyway, so so the but I think it. I totally agree with you. I think it's shocking. It's more shocking when people use it when they want to say vagina rather than a swear word. Mm. Definitely, yeah. definitely, mm. definitely. So that was shocking. But but I I also thought oh maybe that's because it's it's um old. <laughs> Ye olde. Like maybe maybe back then they said things like that. I think I think cunt back then was just used as vagina. Mm. I need to stop saying vagina. <laughs> no, you need to stop saying the c word. Sword, sorry, it's not sorry. The <laughs> sword sheath. Sword sheath. Exactly. Oh yeah, going back to the conversation with uh, the boys from the boys, the, guys, the boys, the boys, the guys from Naive um, uh, But Yeah, it, it was. It is. It is always shocking to for that yeah it just seemed so normalized when they said it which i thought was quite i quite liked how there was a lot of contrast here for instance you would see scenes of debauchery committed by the the upper class you know like throwing the rotten tomatoes at this one guy in slow motion in slow motion with music over it meanwhile Mm -hmm. we've got um rachel vice being dragged through a forest there are definitely some stuff that can't be quoted in a normal conversation. Now, I kept her because uh, I like it when she puts her tongue inside me. Yes. Uh, yeah, visceral. Very, and, uh, very invasive sentence there. And this was said while she was five paces away from the person that she's talking about. Mm. Plus, and also this was her lover like five seconds ago. And they're outside about to go into a carriage. Like, what? It's like you surely don't randomly say that, but I guess because she's the queen and she had a little bit of an attitude, she's like, "That's the way that I make you feel jealous of me." The other funny thing is that, um, and this is something I guarantee you will not thought of. They can say these things because people don't know how to write, so they can't write it down. Only the educated could write. So, I mean, but, so if yeah. you say it in front of a servant, I mean, they're only going to tell people, and that can be argued whether. They can't write it down to say, look, I've got it in writing, because they can't write. Mm -hmm. Maybe that word was used in the blackmail letters. (laughs) Probably. (laughs) Probably. Also Um, used to write in different languages as well, because, you know, that was another thing that was uh, I learned in history. uh, Eventually all the the letters became in English, so everyone, not just the educated, could understand what was going on. uh, That's why newspapers come in, because they're in one common language. They're not just like in French or or, uh, Latin or whatever, you know, so everyone could read it. The Bible, I don't know when, but was translated back to English. Probably. And it was seen as a really uh, anti-religious thing, because it's like Latin apparently was the language of the god... I mean, this would probably be, this is a complete guess, but I would argue it would probably be the King's James Bible. Because yeah, I know that's a yeah. reprint for sure, because he, of when he became, um, he was a very royal obsessed. Well, uh, mm-hmm. we'll talk about languages uh, next week with Mary, Queen of Scots, because oh, yeah. Mary Stuart used to uh, oh, of course, write yes. uh, letters in uh, French. Yeah. Yeah, that's unintelligible to me. The English one, because she was not as good in English, that I've checked a few things, and that's why it's not intelligible for you or or me either, because she was better in French. In French, you understand what she says. So it's not the fact that they spelt things differently back then? (laughs) Ah, okay. I thought that it was... (laughs) Very differently spelled. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Um, What I wanted to say was, um, I I think you you kind of see that when Queen Anne can't read, like she needs glasses, but I'm guessing that either she was too proud to wear glasses or glasses weren't a thing or, you know, when she kept on trying to read the bill or read certain papers when Lady Marlborough like is told to leave the castle because she did all the business stuff. I don't, but I can't believe when you went, when Queen Anne read the bill, I was thinking, like, what What was she buying? What was she paying for? When did she go to a restaurant? <laughs> no, like, I'm like, the Adam, bill of- I'm like her- Adam, you idiot. It's the bill in government, you fool. <laughs> the bill in She's government. not like, how much was that? A bill with her face on. Yeah, exactly. She's like, how much bread did I have? <laughs> the wine cost how much? <laughs> the, um... No, I... Well, that and uh, glasses wouldn't be... No, glasses weren't a thing yet. You'd still have, like, spectacles and got and, uh and monocles and that sort of thing. It's just interesting that she had this this issue with uh, reading and she never kind of helped herself with it. She just brought it closer to her face. And Mm. it's probably just to see how, to show how kind of impotent she was. 
I mean, it's a brutal word. The, sorry. Another point I was going to make is because I was thinking, how funny is history when you think about it? It's like they have the the duck racing, which is uh, the, oh. the the fastest duck is Horatio, and I mean Shakespeare's been dead for nearly like well over eighty years from this when this film takes place. I'm like, yeah. how crazy is history when you think about it? Because eh? for me, it's difficult to pinpoint anything between because obviously I did Wars of Independence. What happened between thirteen fourteen and then? <laughs> 1600s with Shakespeare and like what the hell happened for 300 years yeah like it's absolutely crazy I mean medieval oh yeah yeah, obviously we but we did a lot of medieval time period at school I remember that because we did the black death uh, vigorously I what did you think I don't know if your mum will be able to see this Jan because of the the near death of one of the rabbits (laughs) (laughs) what do you think is or is it just dogs uh, it's probably be too slow. Oh, actually. oh your mom's so it's not even it. about the rabbits. It's the the fact that it's slow paced. Yeah, no I, rabbits I, were harmed in the making of this movie. No, probably. yeah. I mean, I really want her to see Anna and the Apocalypse, but the premise is just not interested by the premise. So ah, oh, shame. <laughs> and she can't enjoy it uh, in its full original English uh, fully. So yeah, mm. but That's uh, she has three grandkids that are. No, two that are English, so she's she's doing the work, putting the work, going to London frequently, and uh, yeah. we're gonna have I'm gonna have a real struggle when we go over, aren't I? That's gonna be. Fun. I'm like Jan. I'm gonna ask this point, and Jan's like, "Ask." This is what he said. Yeah, like, this is, Jan will just be tired of translating for both of the us. The difficulty is, is new, you do understand basic French, and I get oh. certain words. And somebody said "d'accord," I'm like, "Ah, I know that one." Yeah, it's like ah, I know what that one was. I would like a. Uh, 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 all I need is je teste uh, fromage d'accord. That's it. That's all I need. <laughs> je teste de, de, je ne pas fromage d'accord. Yeah. That's it. That's I all mean, I need. I mean, yeah, I'm sure that's not yeah, French. I'm, I'm a, well, it's, I don't, I would like no cheese. Why do I care about cheese? I'm a bookshop, mate. <laughs> <laughs> You're just going to every single store, no. like, no fromage. No, je boulangerie. <laughs> Croissant, yes. Croissant, oui, d'accord. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, For, fromage, de croissant? No, 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 no. A croissant is a nice one because it's also the shape, right? Crescent, croissant. Croissant. Uh huh. Mm, in some quizzes, you had what? What is the pastry that is also a shape? <laughs> <laughs> the French. A roll. Um. So I have one more point until I don't think I have any more to say. Mm? The the last s- uh, bit. With edit the- with the face of the queen and then abigail and then the rabbits what did what did people <laughs> think that that portrayed or did you like it or thoughts guys i mean it was an interesting way to end the movie anyway yeah it was quite uh f- like i felt a bit of fear like it was quite scary because hmm. i didn't really know why <laughs> Well, it didn't uh, help me to get an opinion in either side of the <laughs> of the aisle, for sure. So, um, no. I quite liked... My dad makes a point that villains never succeed. Like, they always get scuppered at the last minute. I mean, this is a case of where... I mean, Emma Stone's character kind of gets what she wants. I mean, she's there. It might not be ev- she might not be everything it's cracked up to be, but she's definitely in a position of somewhat power now. She's won the battle against to be the favourite. But she's a servant and she always will be. I guess, yeah. Right? There, yeah. There is a film like that. I'm not going to say it. I'll show it to you at some point because that would ruin the twist, but with a, a bad guy. Yeah. I don't know what I think about the rabbits. You know, I thought it was interesting, but I couldn't for the life of me start to pick it apart and tell you what, well, actually the rabbit coming in from the top screen on the right actually symbify, symbolifies the the rise of the, the working class because they are all rabbits and uh, God knows what the, what the rabbits are on about. Wow, that's deep. That was me making it up, just having a... Just whatever. Uh, I mean, I'm sure, yeah, some people would have that. I mean, I, I, I personally thought it was... The rabbit signified the 17 dead children. Well, yeah, she says that at the beginning, doesn't she? Yeah. Not in the beginning, but in it's the It's like film. every yeah. single time she had a miscarriage or her child died, she bought a rabbit. It might be a quite easy way of bookending the film because we start with the rabbits and we end with the rabbits. So it might even be yeah. as simple as bookending the, the piece, you know? Yeah. Start or maybe, as you begin. Uh, the end fact- of you begin, sorry. Yeah. The fact that Abigail is about to step on a rabbit for a play... It's like that's the first time the Queen sees Abigail as 
like the real person that she is, like mean and. Well, that uh, Lady Marlborough was right. Yeah. yeah, and Lady Marlborough talks about how you know you think you've won, you haven't won. You're I'm I'm playing the long game. Yeah. So this this is a point where Abigail didn't get to. Like, oh yeah, like I might be free and I might be able to go to parties, but actually I'm a servant mm. and the yeah. queen can do whatever the hell she wants with me. Yeah. The last question I have is, uh, well, earlier on in the film, we see what happens when Abigail's character massages the queen's legs. Oh, yes. Uh, did you think that's what's happening in that final scene or is it just massaging the legs? No, I think that was massaging the legs. I don't think there was anything sexual about that. Yeah, I didn't think that either, but I was curious to see what other people thought. I wondered. Yes, I did too. Uh, both times <laughs> I watched it, but yeah, uh, yeah I was left uh, unsure. Mm. It didn't feel like it was the... But I wondered both times. <laughs> yeah. I don't really have anything else. Mm. We can go into the ratings whenever we want. Cool. So, <laughs> Anouk Yan was the favourite, good, bad, or just plain standard. Anouk? I thought it was really good. I really enjoyed it. Slow paced, but I wasn't bored. And it was beautifully shot. And it was interesting. Like I felt like I could talk about that film forever. There was so much stuff going on and I think you could either watch it on a surface level or like really analyze it. Mm. And I think that makes a good film. Yeah. I really don't know what to do with this movie. So unlike what I did for A Star is Born, which I refused to uh, basically what as was annoyed by the executive that decided to greenlit the project. That's it. Because I loved everything about the movie. In this one, I'm not entirely sure. So until further notice, it's in the limbo. Would you say you feel a bit how I felt in Hereditary? Because I didn't know where to place that. I, and eventually what came down to my decision was, I can appreciate that people would see this and enjoy this film. I didn't necessarily enjoy it, but I can see what it did. So therefore, I would rate it good, but I didn't enjoy it. I, I, or is it just difficult for you to process? It, yeah, I didn't, sit with it, see what happens. Yeah, I didn't get anything that made me. Well, I watched it the second time because the first time was in small screen. Mm. But um, yeah, I clearly don't want to to see it a third time. So probably I don't know where. Yeah, you had you created the limbo to put Ghostbusters, uh, 2016 in. My first was Hereditary, and now I'm putting this one is Fair in, enough. and which is. Uh, I may revisit those because hereditary. Uh, I think we need to talk with my brother about it when we're in uh, because he liked it in a way that we didn't. Mm. So that's uh, interesting, and we had some nice insight and uh, point of view from Paul, yeah, the Isolani, which I liked, and yeah, I agreed with you. Yeah. Ha- helped me reshape a bit my mm. my view on that. Yeah, but uh, yeah, for now it's in the limbo for me. Cool. Yeah. I would say good, but in contrast to Nick, I would say fast paced. Oh, there you go. I do, I do think this has a real nice pace to it. I don't think it's slow at all. I think it it powers through and doesn't linger. But then again, I've not seen a lot of period pieces, so maybe, what do I know? But I for mean, me, I guess if you put it next to Call Me By Your Name, definitely. Yeah. Or even Roma. Yeah. Like, true. Roma lingers, and that's the real slow-paced movie, but I would say this is a romping pace. I mean, yeah. yeah. But it's maybe the the specific pace of that director, because it, there was the same kind of pace for the killing of the sacred deer, which felt slow, hmm. but probably wasn't as much as Call Me By Your Name. Yeah. Before we go, now that we've seen both, we've seen The Favourite, we've seen Roma. Uh-huh. Which are the two that everyone says it's basically between these two for Best Picture and Best Director. Yeah. What do we think now? Roma. Roma wins. Yeah, I, 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 I... Gets my vote. Yeah, Roma, and we'll probably elaborate on that when we do. We will do an Oscar episode. Sure. I think they're very different films, though. I th- so I think it's totally personal. I think there are some people that would def... Because the, in the BAFTAs, the favourite did better, right? It had seven, and I think Roma had four, mm. if I remember correctly. But of course, in the Oscars, I think they both have the same amount, like... It's something like that. Um, yeah. I think they have the same amount of awards together. In- so it just, I think it just depends on your personal preference. Um, I- but yeah, yeah, so no, I'm just saying that. Um, I think the battle, it's, it's come down to about three categories. It's, it's lead, act- lead actress, best film, best director. In my opinion, the direction needed for Roma was harder than this film. And getting that result means a better director because of the the, the the ability to direct somebody that's never acted before, also in that style, everything like that. That adds up. 
Whereas directing in this film is very much based on like where we're going, angles, story, pace. Because again, pace is down to direction. So it's and it's, editing. It's, and editing. And it's a whole different combination, which makes it a really interesting contest to see and probably talk more deep into what makes the award for best director. Is it how you handle certain people on a, on a, on a film set, with their ability to get a, a relative good, a, a amazing performance? Or is it down to artistic direction of where you take your film and manage all the other that other departments? You know, it's it's what makes a, the best director. Yeah. And for me, I would say it's for Roma because it's it's what you what you were balancing somebody that's never acted before and to get that performance out of them is is incredible. I think we're assuming though she might have been super easy to work with. No, I'm not. I, I, I'm not saying. I'm not arguing in that defence. I'm arguing with somebody that's not a professional actress. I mean, in, in the the favourite, you're working with three professional actresses. I guess, but that doesn't mean that she'd be harder to work with. No, I'm not saying harder to work with. No, or even she she had she had to have more direction. It might have been easier because she could just be as real as possible. I guess, I guess, but you've also remembered you've got to, a director is more than just what you see on screen. It's how you handle everything else. Like if somebody that's never done acting before to appear in a feature line film, there's also that mental and mental capacity and. The, the, the logistics of that, like being on a set, how to cope with learning the lines, how to be, work with continuity, what order we shoot in, all all these other factors that we don't see on the screen. I think there's that's the argument we've got to have for direction as well. Yeah, so I I I feel like the editing is 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 better in the favourite somehow. I think that's why it seems so it, like fast paced, like well paced anyway, mm. because the editing is so well done. But yeah, it's, it's just for film. Roma wins for me. Mm. Anyway, that was a really roundabout way of saying that um, one line. <laughs> <laughs> Before we go, let me introduce you to the box. So we had a production meeting recently <laughs> and we thought when we have those periods of time where our schedule is settled, we have all the movies we wanted to have and we can add uh, some of the movies, like I added Predestination in there, that uh, sometimes when we have, uh, you know, oh, we're feeling like we could record something for the pool of episode. There's the where we have the box with those uh, in there. I Let me see. I'll put them there. What was that? Moneyball? Yeah, Moneyball. The Aaron Sorkin film with Brad Pitt cool. about the baseball team. Cool. It's and a very, very interesting movie. There's a few of those in there. So um, expect uh, some of those stuff that are coming out of the blue. Yeah. Um, so thank you for listening again, guys. Thank uh, you. We were Adam, Anouk, and Jan. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Uh, something I quickly forgot to talk about, the favorite. I wanted to do kind of fake intro because basically it would have been like the favorite 2018, inspired by the true events of Luke Benjamin Bernard. His spiritual and physical transformation is told through the life of two brothers. And then it would have been funny to realize that it's not the same movie because on the same year, 2018, two movies with the same title, except there is no you in the movie I just talked about. Oh, oh it's the American Different spelling. spellings. Yes, yes. So, so, <laughs> It's, uh, there's always this thing that sometimes the, the titles, because, uh, movies, they can't be called a certain title because it's been used before. They have to pay rights or something. Mm. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what that whole thing is, but yeah, that would have uh, been nice too. But I won't pretend we, I did the joke on a day because you, as you can see, everything is different, even the sofa. No, yeah, the sofa's not orange. Oh, so, no. so, so I will add that little bit at the end yeah. of the favorite. And, uh, yeah, so now we, we know, uh, we know who won and yeah. stuff. So you'll hear all about that in the Oscars episode. Yeah. Which actually was an hour, surprisingly. Yeah. Cool. Mm. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Good, the Bad and the Just Plain Standard podcast. If you like what you heard, you can leave us a review via iTunes. If you want to keep up to date with what we're doing, you can check us out on Facebook and Instagram at Good Bad Standard Podcast on both platforms. If you fancy seeing the live streams that we talk about on the podcast, they can be found on YouTube.com. You search for Milk in a Wine Glass. There are other bits and bobs on there too, just to see what Jan's up to during the week. And if you really like us, like really, really like us, why don't you head on over to Patreon.com slash Good Bad Standard Podcast and have a look if you want to support us. Any small donation is appreciated.